So, um, I gave feedback on the, uh, uh, project proposal, right? And the, the big thing about it is when you're proposing something, you want to tell a story. And the way it was set up, it, it just jumped around too much. It, it started off with high level, jumped down to dis low level detail, jumped up a little bit. Whereas it didn't have a, a, a cohesive flow, right, to say this is why we should do this project. And I gave some sort of detailed comments on it in Blackboard. So have a look at that. Um, but uh, we, we don't have time to do too much about going back and fixing it. I'm happy to look at a, a, a redraft, but um, it's end of semester next week, right? So we gotta, we got to get the preliminary design done. Um, right, so that's where we are. And then the f next week, I don't know whether we want to do the presentations or we whether how we want to do that. Um, previously, what I've done is I've got the students to make a video, but because we are online, right? So, and then present the video and then be available for questions during and at the end of the video. I'm okay doing it that way. I'm also okay you presenting live. The trouble is it's just me as a, the audience. Normally we'd have a couple of other groups, right? So, um, so these are the things I wanted to try and do differently from what I did previously in this class. And I think I've mostly done them. The only thing I haven't touched on as much as I wanted to is how to plan. And uh, we, we sort of talked about that in uh, basically just use Microsoft Project, right? Get all the tasks. That was one piece of feedback I had about the, the plan in the preliminary, in the project proposal. Not detailed enough at all, right? Normally at that stage you want to plan with about, I don't know, 20 to 30 tasks in it. I think the plan had maybe 10 or 12. Um, plus, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean, um, it's nice in a plan to have milestones and you've got self-made milestones, right? You've, you've got um, Right, we've got the uh, program review, detailed design document, detailed design presentation, other program review, final design document, final design presentation, working prototype. Right, you've got self-made, so there, there you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things in your, in your plan already, and they're just the milestones. And how do you get to program review one? How do you get to the detailed design document? How do you get to the presentation? How do you get to the working prototype? Uh, so, um, so I, I thought I'd quickly talk about not so much planning but tracking the plan. I think previously I showed you, where are we? Um, oops. <coughs> yeah, that one will do it. Right, I showed you these plots. Right, so these plots are me taking the students' plans and looking at how much they've done on that plan out of the, if everything on the plan is done, it's 100% done. And this is them checking off 
the, uh, the, the different tasks they had in the plan. Uh, and I, just to give them a little bit of a sense of urgency, I put in, oh, did I? Yeah, we did that. Um, just to give them a little bit of a sense of urgency, I, I put a linear fit onto each of the project's trajectories to see whether we'd finish in time, right? And the only one, this, this location here is the end of semester. And you want to be 100% done at the end of semester. Right? And the only one that was looking like it was going to be finished at this point was the fridge. Because parking looked like it was Yeah, it wasn't going to finish until the semester after they needed to finish. Now the funny thing was, this doesn't tell you what's actually happening. In fact, of these three projects, I suspect parking was actually further ahead than the other two. But it didn't show up in the way they planned. That's okay. And they all finished. They all, um, actually, I don't know whether they all graduated yet. Some of them had a couple of other courses to, to make up. But they, they all finished Capstone. Mm -hmm. So what I, wanted, what I thought it'd be good to do is, how am I calculating these numbers? And there's a, there's a standard way, hey Matt, there's a standard way of doing that, those measurements. It's called the earned value management system. Right, so this is what you do to put together a, a project. You set the goals, write down the tasks, you measure progress, and it's that piece that I want to talk about specifically. Um, you compare the actual with the planned, and then you take any corrective action if the actual is not meeting the plan. Yeah, Chuck, what's up? Exactly. You, you, if you've done any project management courses before, you've probably heard the, the terms. So I I'm just, just thought it'd be good to go through them again. So one thing that's, that's kind of interesting is just about every project looks like this. It's called the S-curve, right? It looks like you're not doing enough work at the beginning. And then all of a sudden you, you take off and you do a, a really good job of getting stuff done. And then the last bit takes forever to get finished. Whereas ideally, right, you'd want something like a straight line. But that never happens. It's nearly always hard graft at the beginning. Then all of a sudden you, you, you get into the zone. <laughs> you get things happening, and then nailing down every little bit at the end is a pain. Now you can use that uh, planned information, this is the planned information, and compare it to the actual. Maybe. Right. And you can say something about uh, whether your spend rate is right or whether your um, progress is right. So this is what I was saying b just before you came in, Matt. We've got some self We've already got milestones, right? We've got project review one, detailed design document, detailed design presentation, review two, final design, 
document, final design presentation, working prototype. So there are seven milestones, things that you have to do uh, in order to, to get through the project. And the idea is you, you, they should be a significant accomplishment, right? They should show that you've done something. In your case, it's, you know, tied to assessment, but it, it's still just about any project I've been on has the review after each stage. You've got to have a document which has all the detail. You've got to have a slide deck which shows all the pretty pictures to upper management. And then you have the review meeting where you present the slide deck and people can ask you questions. And the way you do this, you, the way you put milestones on is you c there's a, a little box you can check on the properties of each task. And when you say it's a milestone, they come up as little diamonds. Milestones should be as a separate line item in projects. And they generally have zero days as the duration. Now, that doesn't mean having the document or me meeting the milestone isn't valuable. And one, funnily enough, earned value is about value. And it's easy to see value in tasks, right? Tom is working for, I don't know, a week or, th or sorry, three days on item A, right? And we know Tom costs 40 bucks an hour. Three days is eight hours, so three times eight times 40. That's how much item A costs. That's the value, the planned value for item A. Same with uh, B, Jeff, maybe Jeff costs Maybe Jeff's a little cheaper, he costs 30 bucks. Right? But it's still four days times eight times 30. You get a cost. Maybe Sue is uh, a little bit more senior, and maybe she costs 50 bucks an hour. Right? But it's only two days. So two times eight times 50. So you can get a you can get a value for each of the timed tasks, and then, like I said, it's worthwhile putting a value on the untimed tasks too, because it it's, it means something when you deliver a, a milestone, right? So usually, these ones are called fixed cost, whereas these are timed cost. Like that's actually a milestone. I got the. Uh, let's uh, put it on A rather than. Right, you can see that that one's a milestone as well. Okay. Now. The trick comes between item A being planned to take three days and whether item A actually takes three days. You notice item B was planned to take four days, but, oh, it's a different item B, but anyway, this item B is seven days. Uh, so you've got some some differences. So the first thing you do when you do the plan is put all the tasks out, you put all the, well, I usually put all the milestones in. I then usually put a, what's called a summary task for each part. So in hours, there would be a, uh, uh, a prototyping and des detailed design 
summary task and then a finalizing design and prototype summary task. The next thing you do is you put the appropriate uh, milestones under each of those items and then you figure out well what do I have to do to get all that done and the thing to focus on forget about the documentation forget about the presentation what do you need to do to build the robot right. once you've got all of that information in Microsoft Project has a thing called baseline and all that does is it if you've ever used uh, source control like git or subversion or what have you it allows you to take a snapshot of where the plan is now and then when you update the plan project remembers the baseline so even if tasks take longer the baseline was still three days for, for, for step B so the three things you're re usually interested in in project management are oops cost schedule and actually getting it done right. and the S curves are usually just looking at cost and schedule and sometimes there are things called tracking control charts they really only look at performance and schedule whereas EVMS earn value tries to look at all three and these are the numbers that you need in order to do earned value. The planned value is either time for each task. It should be task times hourly rate. And you pull an hourly rate out of the air, right? Make it easy, make it $20 pay yourselves lots, make it a hundred dollars, wh whatever, you, you need to have a, an hourly rate. Or, if you've got milestones, a fixed rate. And I usually suggest something like about, I don't know, uh, $500 or, I don't know, $250, something like that, maybe a thousand. it shouldn't completely overwhelm the, the 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 time time cost but it should be reasonable so you've got your you've got your your plan right so this one's three this one's two then there's a milestone and then there's another two Right, so let's say each of these blocks is 100. So that's 300, 200, 200, and let's use 100 for that. Right, so the total plan value for this simple thing is 300 plus 200 plus 100 is 600. It's 800 dollars. Right, so that's the planned value. Now, earned value is what you get when you finish each task. And earned value is just the planned value. Right? So when I when I finish this task, so this is uh, PV and here the earned value, I finished that task and so I've earned 300. I haven't finished the other tasks, so the earned value for those things is zero. 
When I finish those things, I learn the value. Then you've got to look at the actual cost. Right? So maybe maybe it actually took me four days to do it instead of three. So that means my actual cost was four hundred. Now from those, you can generate two numbers. They're normalized, so if everything is on schedule and everything is on cost, the number is one. One's the schedule performance index and one's the cost performance index. Okay, so we've got those. So let's just see whether we've got some numbers. There we go. So the SPI is the earned value divided by the planned value. Right, and let's go back to our example. Let's say We're going to figure out what's happened here. Right? So at this time, at this time, we planned to have those two things done. Right? So our planned value was 500. Our earned value was 300, and our actual were 400. We hadn't started on the second task yet. So let's go back here. So earned value on planned value. So our EV is our schedule, I think. Is that right? Yeah, so e earn value on PV is our SPI. So earn value is 300, plan value is 500, right? So it's 0.6. And our cost performance index is, I think, earned value on actuals. And just 300 on 400. And both of those numbers are less than one, which means we're in a bad way. Um, you know, I, I made it, I'm making this up as I go along, so it's So those are the two things that I used. Now let's just have a look at what's happening. Right, here's our, here's our planned value. That's where we thought we would be. If everything was completely on track, our actual costs, would be whatever the budget is, 
and the time would be exactly where PV is. Right? But we've actually in this in, in this example, we've actually earned more value than we planned. So uh, we've got some difference in the schedule. But also, we've spent more than we expect. And that usually goes hand in hand, right? If you make more progress, oftentimes you have to burn through resources, buying stuff more quickly if you're ahead of, uh, if you're ahead of plan. Now, I, I don't like this example, um, and the reason I don't, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain what's happening here, and we can talk about why I don't like it. Right? So here we've got um, a list of tasks, and we've got three months, right? January, February, March, actually four months, January, February, March, April. Right, and here we've got the numbers that each task is going to take in each month. So here we've got 15 because we've uh, we're 100% complete, so we can capture our value. Right? This is the these are the planned values for each of them. And then this is the earned value. This piece here is the earned value. So here we've got a hundred. We're done with staffing, so we can capture all fifteen of the plans. This one is saying that we've got we've only done eighty percent of the blueprint, and so the the value we've earned is eight eighty percent of the planned value. Why I don't like that is because if you have a big plan, what you can do, you can game the system. You can say, okay, I've got, I'm way behind on this, but I, I want to hide it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off all 10 future tasks and say that I'm 10% done on all of those. And that'll capture more earned value. So these ones are all partially completed. These will capture more value. So it'll look like I'm further ahead than I really am. Even though the blueprints are actually going to take me 20 days. But I'm, I'm, I'm making headway because I've done a little bit of extra on the, the future one. The way you combat that, the way you fix that problem, is you say you can't earn value until the task is done. Right. So anyway, um, so the the plots that I, I showed you. All I did, go back to those plots. Right, I just, this number is too blue. Right? So this number here, this percentage, is just the earned value um, divided by planned value at that time. Hmm? Oops, wrong one. Oh well. So it was really just 
the schedule performance index in a percentage form. Right, so instead of between 0 and 1, it was between 0 and 100. I wasn't that interested in the cost, right, because you're, you, you're doing it anyway. What I was interested in was finishing on time. And I think that's all I wanted to say, really. Right, so these are other approaches. That example used the, the percentage complete rule to, to calculate the, the earned value. My rule was the 0, 100 rule, right? Either you capture all value or you get no value. You only capture all value when the task is done. Some people allow you to be a little bit finer grained than that and let you to capture half the value once you're halfway through the task. But uh, UTC used to use the 0, 100 rule. You're not allowed to capture value until it's done. Okay. Um, I am done. We need to do preliminary design. Do you have any questions? You, Chuck, you look like you've got a question. Anything? I mean, you, you don't need Microsoft Project to do this. In fact, I, I when my, I did a, I used to teach a software project management course, and I just got the students to use Excel, right? You, you can just put in, okay, that you can put dates in Excel, you can put times in Excel, you can put rate, uh, pay rates in Excel, and just calculate it direct, right? You don't, you don't need, well, project's nice because it gives you the Gantt chart and everything. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's pretty close. Um, the only thing I would say is I, 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 I want to try and see if I can find the video quickly. Um, Kenya, did you have a... You look, no, you okay? Matt, you're okay? Yeah? The only thing I would say is take everything with a grain of salt. Now, I'm not going to show you the whole video. Uh, let's see if we can put that back there. And as the peacock's tail acts as a cue for a healthy and reproductive bird, so the Gantt chart can be used as a cue for being organized and in control even when you're not. This is a former colleague of mine, John Whitty, and he studies project management. That's his research area. And one of the things he says, exactly what he said, that the way you tell who the project manager is, is they're the person with the Gantt chart. And his take is that one of the only things the Gantt chart does is identify the project manager. Doesn't necessarily help getting the project done. My name's John Whitty, and I spend some of my time thinking about and examining what makes project managers tick. There was an article on project management in The Economist in 2005 and the byline read 
companies are increasingly keen on projects. Why, when so many fail? Now that sums up rather nicely one of the paradoxes of project management, in that it appears to be popular and that at the same time it appears not to work. We make the assumption that modern project management has something to do with delivering projects on time and on budget. But modern project management doesn't have to be about that. Perhaps it's also a tool used for surviving in the corporate environment. I could quote you something from a textbook, but I don't think that those standard definitions are particularly defensible. I'm interested in resolving this apparent paradox of project management. Why is it popular when it appears to be broken? I conducted a piece of research that looked at the emotional affects, various project management artifacts like schedules and deadlines have on long-standing project managers. And in the study, one particular artifact, the Gantt chart, stood out. And one of the participants' comments sums up nicely the behavior I observed. He said, it's the Gantt charts that keeps my manager out of my office so I can get on with my work. And this is when I first really glimpsed that Gantt charts are used for reasons other than scheduling tasks and resources. Okay, I'm not going to show you the whole video, but like I said, um, take, a, take all of this stuff with a grain of salt. Uh, and as I said earlier with the, the, the three projects from the last cohort, the one that seemed to be most behind was the one that was actually furthest ahead. So there was a, there's a disconnect there. Doesn't mean you don't plan, you've still got to plan. But uh, you've got to be able to adjust and do something different to get stuff done. Okay, um, let me just go here and into uh, Blackboard. I just wanted to have a look at the document. All right, so where are we? It there. there we go. So I said earlier, right, the the big thing that the project proposal should tell a story. And I just got, right, we started off with people with physical disabilities often require assistance with moving around and picking items up. Great, that's, that's at a high level, that's visionary, right, that's, that's where you're going. Designing an app controlled robot that will allow people to stay where they are without having to physically move. That's coming down a level, but that's okay. And then using a high density, so you're getting really bogged down in the detail way too early. This is the abstract. It should be a reason why you need to read the rest of the document. Right. I would actually take that whole... The other thing about this is talking about Raspberry Pis and motors and stuff. This should be about why. This document should be about why. It shouldn't necessarily go into too much detail about the um, how the the actual thing to do and in this the the next paragraph is fine um, 
I'd probably strike the last sentence. Just uh, again, this should be uh, a high level thing. Statement of need that maybe there we go. Um, reference there's a, a percentage there, right? 12.7 percent or something. There should be a reference. There is a reference in the reference list, but it's not connected to that number at all. Right? When you reference something, if you're using IEEE style, you uh, connect directly. Right? I think I put the uh, link in the rubric. Maybe I didn't. Where did I put the link? Oh, I must have put the link in the actual comment. Right? So down the bottom here. Right, there's a right. I'm an IEEE guy, so I tend to to go with IEEE format. So every reference should be numbered, and then when you refer to something in the text, there's the number in square brackets beside the. Uh, text that's referencing the, the thing. Right? Everything else you've got in the in the uh, references looks good. The right it's got all the right information. Right? There's a URL, it says it's online when you last accessed it, uh, when it was published, that's all good. Uh, it should have an author, although I suppose they do have authors. I would have put the author first rather than after the title. That's okay. But there should be numbers. Um, What else? So, I thought I highlighted this particular part here. Right? Um, this section is organizational information, and then smack dab in the middle of the organization, there's stuff about the battery. Right? It, it, it's, it was quite jarring when I was reading. Like I said, there should be a flow. You can talk about this stuff. It, it needs to be in the document. It's just that the, the document doesn't flow. Okay. So have a look at my comments and uh, happy to... Happy to uh, give more feedback. So this is some of the stuff that we need to get done. Right, we know what we're building, but now we've got to identify the subsystems. Right, subsystems. Robot chassis. Robot drive. Robot brain. Robot sensors. App. Do I need a server? to connect everything up. Right, so the way I usually do this so the that sort of thing is what I would call a high level architecture. Um, and I think I might have one somewhere here. Is that one? No, there it is, high level architecture. Right, I like using boxes. Right, this is actually UML. It's called a UML deployment diagram. And the 3D boxes are pieces of hardware. Uh, and this particular one, there's no 
uh, mechanical hardware in it, it's just a software system. But I have a, uh, a servicer device, which was my phone. I have a customer device, which were the computers in the lab. And somewhere out there I have a server that presents web information. The connectivity was via HTTPS. And sitting on my web server, I had, sorry, sitting on my take a number server, I have a web server and a database. Your preliminary design document should have something like this. You don't have to use specifically UML, just colored boxes is fine, but just identify the pieces and how they connect together. Partic one thing that a lot of systems engineers are really interested in is um, what are the interfaces? How do you connect two pieces of the system app? Right Here I've got HTTPS. HTTPS, that's just one line. But when you think about all the things that go into making HTTPS, right, there's lots. You've got to make sure that there's a, a port open on the server to allow HTTPS traffic. You've got to have a, an SSL certificate to have a valid, right? You've got to have, a, have an SSL certificate to make sure that that little thing there says connection is secure. Because if you don't have an SSL certificate, that's not going to be there. Right, this one's coming from GitHub, and it tells you all about the, the details of the certificate. Right, it's going to be valid until 2023 April. So that's something that should be in the preliminary design. Let's go back to the there. And that's, that's why I was saying the interfaces should be clearly described. Because in your case, you've got an app that has to talk to the robot. How are you going to, what's that interface? Is it Wi-Fi? Is it Bluetooth? Is it a cord? How do you, how do you connect? Is it a USB connection? All of that information should be on the system block diagram. We've got shell statements, but underneath all of those shell statements, how is this going to work, right? How do you... One way to think about operational stuff is when the user first takes it out of the box, what do they do, right? They've just got a, a turned-off robot. Do, do they have to download an app? Probably. When they get the robot out of the box, do they just turn it on? Do they have to charge it up? Do they have to put a new battery in it? What, what, what's, the, what's the operational thing that happens? You've got your shall statements, right? On the other end, Right, so we're going back all the way back to our uh, design V, right? You've got your shell statements. How are you going to test it? Verification. You know what the functional and non-functional or cross-functional requirements are? How are you going to be able to say, yes, this functional requirement was met? Right? That's what verification is all about. Does the requirement, does the device do what the requirement says? And you can do that at this stage, right? You, you don't even have a, haven't even bought any hardware, but you can certainly define the success criteria.
right? And then you've got to have sufficient detail to know that you can go to the next step. And we haven't had any haven't had any specific comments about problems, so you should be good there. Um, you've already done this, but one thing that should happen between the project proposal and this is both the project schedule and the project budget should be further refined. With the schedule, that means you need more tasks and you need identify who's going to be doing each of the tasks mm. and that will more clearly identify member roles and that's what I just said schedule and budget okay um, I could go through all of that rubric stuff for the preliminary design document, but I suggest you read it. I'm not going to read it for you. If you do everything I just said, that'll be fine. Sorry, this? Yeah, yeah. Yep, this is all. So the, the rubric and everything should be all available. Um, this particular page. Let's see if we can uh, figure out. Copy link to page. I can post that. Let's uh, do that here. Just edit that and send it in an email too. Okay. Um, I don't have any other thing to do today. I suggest you spend some time um, having a look at my comments and until you're here, work on uh, getting the preliminary design kicked off okay unfortunately there's not much time but anyway it is what it is we'll uh, I'll take account of that when when I'm uh, uh, looking at it next week we've got next week and then the following week I want you to go and see the 498 presentations next door uh, there okay Thank you. Let me just shut down.